back at it for another edition of Play by Playcast. It is the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. It's a professional development pod that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play by play announcers in the business. My name is Joel Godet. He is Dave Sims, most known uh, these days from the Seattle Mariners, but also uh, from network television on Fox Sports during basketball season. Uh, Dave, appreciate you taking the time. Good to be here, Joe. Thanks for the invitation, man. Appreciate it. No, my pleasure. I'm I'm excited for this. Um, and I I, I want to dive right in uh, because I think in in social media snippets, a lot of people would know you from uh recently speaking, things like the Mitch Hanniger call and the hey now, hey now. C Shack, the pitch. But I want to dive into your approach in big moments because I think you you really capture those really well. It's one of the best things about what you do on the air as a play-by-play broadcaster. So I wanted to dive into your mindset of when you know the moment is big and when you know something is about to happen or could be about to happen, um, how do you lock yourself in and prepare for what you know is the prime time of what we do? Well, I know preparation is a big, big word in our industry and what we do, but, you know, I think of the Cal Raleigh uh, home run against the A's, against Acevedo, and he was at the 22 season, got us into the playoffs on a Saturday night, I think it was. Uh, he hits a home run. I'm not sitting there. You know, in baseball, you know, preparing. I think mentally, uh, just living life. I mean, I, I, I as a sports consumer, I've experienced it. As a sports writer, I know what it's like. I know what I'm looking at. I'm not generally preparing something. If he hits a home run, I'm going to say this. I, it's visceral, man. I just go with it. Um, you can't prepare for these moments. I mean, last, you know, I, I've done a million basketball games and, you know, guy launches a three. You don't know what's going in. Guy throws one from three quarter court. You don't know what's going in. You, you, you rise to the occasion at the moment. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I've been a, I've been a jock all my life. I've been a sports consumer all my life. Um, I think I'm, I'm not a Shakespearean actor or anything, but I, I've read enough over the years. I know drama when I see it. And, you know, basically, you know, I, and I, I do high, high energy in spots like that. I mean, that's basically it. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you know, if this happens, I, I have this prepared, yada, yada. And that doesn't work like that. What I think was cool about the, the Mitch Hanniger call in particular, and I love the fact that the video exists of it, is because... Um, if you go back and watch it, you say, what a night. And then there's like five or six seconds of silence and you're looking around. Um, you, your lips are moving. So I don't know if you're saying something to yourself. Like what what happens in that moment? Great, huge hit. What process yeah, is in your mind? Yeah, it was, you know, I said, what a night because he'd hit a home run. I think third inning hit a bomb into the bullpen left center field. They uh, gave the Mariners the lead, and then he had another hit. And then so he was already rolling. He was like two for two and a couple, three ribbies. And, you know, just put it all in context, um, that base hit scored two runs, gives the Mariners the lead in the eighth inning. He had been a horse all year. And, yeah, I just – I know from <laughs> – when I, was, I worked at the New York Daily News, I worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer, both AM papers – and so I've had to write a you know thousand bullet and leads you know as the game ends you know and we're three thirty two to go you know Julius Serving hit a jump shot you know to get the seventy six and one over the Nets yada yada so that kind of stuff you know knowing the structure uh, of how to put together uh, you know in, in English and and with some excitement with some verve um, and I, I just rolled with it and I just and and. I don't expect everybody to have been with me for minute one in that broadcast or any telecast. But, you know, I said, you know, what a night, what a night, because it was. And I didn't, have, you know, at that point, that's the headline. Then I'm going to go into it. 
you know, seconds later. Letting letting it breathe. I learned from a guy I lovingly call uh, my sports rabbi, the great Marty Glickman, who who was such an impactful and consequential uh, force for anybody who is from from or worked in New York over the last 40, 50 years. And even if you're young, if you went back and looked at it, listened to Marty and his his history, his story and all that. And, uh, and, and, and then of course, you know, Mr. Scully in his later years, I, I was, I used to have a lot of conversations with him. I would call him on his birthday at CEM when we played the Dodgers and uh, the importance of letting the moment breathe. And that's basically what I was doing. Yeah. My mouth was moving. I was sort of saying, I was sort of in that moment, I was saying what I wanted to say, but I was like, Hey dummy, don't say a damn thing. Save it. Count. You know, and I, I wasn't like clocking myself, but I knew darn well, you had to let that breathe. Let, you know, Harry Carey always said, let's, let's crawl, you know, and the crowd was going absolutely berserk at, you know, the Cal moment, the Hanniger moment. So you got to hear that. There's nothing like, you know, Vince Scully always talked about lying in front of his, uh, you know, his, uh, the big 1930s and 40s radio that stood four or five feet tall. And he, he said he would lie down in front of it, put a pillow and listen to the, and the roar of the crowd. And my old man, I remember him talking about listening to Bill Stern back in the thirties and big 10 games. And, and, the, you know, that's, Man, that that is just gold hearing a crowd going nuts like that. So that that's that's what I did. That was followed by "Hey Now, Hey Now." Um, yeah, and- you know, I I I can't I don't, oh uh, the, the Gary Shandling show, yep. and um, uh, his Ed McMahon. Uh, uh, what's the, the actor's name? I'm blanking on the guy's name right now. Uh, but anyway, he it was a "Hey Now, Here's Gary." You know that whole thing. I was like that, and one, I don't know one time. Uh, you know, I, I can cuss like a sailor, but obviously I'm not going to do it on the air. Um, and I just, I, I tried it a couple of times. My kids liked it. They're grown men now. They liked it. And I just, you know, I, I, I did it. And it's now become, you know, pretty signature, uh, especially for big moments. In the, and even people go, you know, it's a big moment when he says, hey, now, three times. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a night it's a moment if he says hey now, but if it's a, that means it's big. Well, you save you know you save your ammo for the right time. How do you stumble on things you like in that regard? Like, if, if, hey, this thing that I come across, that I read, that I talk about, that I see on television, that might play well if I use it on the air somewhere. When does that click? Well, precisely, it's all about living. I mean, and experiencing things, and reading, and and talking to people, and watching uh, watching events on TV, and. You know, I, I went eight years of Catholic school and, and grammar was always huge. And then, you know, I went to prep school and that was always big there. And I, I think, uh, and, you know, I, I, there's a frustrated actor in me. I'm not good at rem- you know, memory, memorizing scripts or any of that kind of stuff. But I, I'm comfortable in front of people. And um, so, you know, that that's where it comes to. And I just react. I mean, it's the whole being a sports fan, a sports guy, a sports broadcaster. I mean, it's pretty much most of my fiber. So it all, I'd like to say it comes pretty natural to me. I mean, I was broadcasting games with electric football with the magnetic man that would go do that whole thing. And I can remember being like 10, 11 years old and guys breaking my chops. I'm sitting there, you know, calling play by play and dice games and stuff like that. And yeah, I've listened to just about anybody and everybody back in the day when they had a transistor radio, it was about yo big and and, it, and I grew up in Philly, you know, you listen if the Phillies on the West Coast, I'd fall asleep, listen to the Phillies broadcast. And if I could pull in another broadcast, I just loved hearing that stuff. So, I mean, this was this was uh, this is the business I was meant to be in. Uh, you brought it up. I have it uh, later in my chart here of uh, something you learned from Marty Glickman. But I, I wanted to dive into that a little bit more because being uh, in New York City, Marty Glickman is like the the epitome of broadcasting. Uh, what Sports else? Broadcasting, you're darn right. Yeah, yeah. no question. He did what, it all. What else did he teach you that sticks with you most to this day? Well, uh, I I do radio as well as TV. I do it's about 55, 45 TV to radio, but and I enjoy it. it it's you know, it's horseshoes and hand grenades. are two different disciplines. And um, Marty was always telling, "Hey, man, describe. I want you know, as a listener." And think about maybe you're broadcasting to a blind person or somebody whose sight, you know, they they, they yeah, can't watch TV. Or, you know, you're driving to or from grandma's house 
and I can and I can remember this myself, and I'd be coming from my wife's grandparents back, you know, got a long time ago be, before I got hit the. I was still on talk radio at the time, but describe what you see, smell, all five senses, and field and court geography is just crazy. You just can't go, you know. Uh, right. I can, he gave example, and I, and I know I put this to use. I can remember I did a lot of uh, Green Bay games, and Rodgers was there. You know, Rodgers breaks it, and, and if, if once the if the color the analyst you know if he says his piece in enough time, Rodgers and, and the Packers break break the huddle. Four fifty nine to go here in the third quarter. It's seventeen ten. Packers under center. Rodgers takes a snap. Long count. Looks left. Looks right. Takes a snap. Five step drop. Looks to his right. Throws to his right. And complete to Jordy Nelson for seven yards, tackled by Joe Smith. Uh, just outside the numbers, that's a, uh, a game of five. It'll be third down five. Where's the ball? Time and score, obviously. But on radio, on radio for basketball, where's the dang ball, too? You know, on in basketball, Marty was the first to talk about, you know, top of the key. You know, he would be very descriptive. You know, left wing, right wing, left baseline. Hubie Brown always talked about in the low blocks. So you got to describe that on TV, on radio, a little less so on TV because you can see it. And I take a lot of pride and 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 I, I try to make sure I discipline myself. If I get away from it, I always bring myself back in on radio. You're not doing talk radio. If you're doing a radio play-by-play -play game. You got to tell people what is happening at that moment. Hey, tell me the uniform colors. Who's going right to left? Where, where is, and I remember Marty saying this, and I said, damn, how come I never thought of, where's your broadcast location? Are you courtside? Are you at midcourt? Are you in the loge? Are you in the, like, uh, the mezzanine level? Are you in the corner? Like I had to do, I did an Arizona UCLA game on Westwood One Radio Basketball. And I was in a far right corner, elevated maybe 20 feet, and I could barely see anything at the far baseline. You know, what's your vantage point? Are you coming from up top? Like if you're doing a hockey game, uh, are you up in the skybox? Are you between... The uh, between the you know, you're in a blue line, you're in a, 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 a red line, or you maybe in a corner or something. In Dallas, at uh, at Jerry's World, the national they put the national radio booth, and you know you can so you, you envision a rectangle of a uh, you know the, of a, a gridiron, a football field. I was up in the upper corner in the eighth floor, murder trying to see anything far than the far end. Same thing, and I would describe that, and I would just rail on it, and. And in Washington, you're in the you're in the mid you're in the mezzanine level in the corner. How do you see anything? I remember I wound up getting to do some Monday night games when Marv was doing Marv Albert was doing Monday night football, and he he went to Washington. I think that one time he said, "I'm not doing this again." <laughs> and I wound up getting to do some games there, and the fans are right there to try to reach into the box and everything. So it's it's nuts. But so that's that's my deal on that. And on TV, you're I remember Marty used to say, "Hey, yeah, your captions." service on TV. It's television, so I can see what happened. And because of John Madden and his personality and his ability to break down stuff, basically, you know, you're the captain on uh, on a radio broadcast is play-by-play, -play, but to start a show on TV and hopefully you have somebody good with a good personality and the ability to describe and tell stories is the caller analyst. And you basically, you know, Dick Enberg was great at that. One of my all-time broadcast heroes, you know, and now oh, what a run by LaDainian Tomlinson picks up 15. That's a first down for the Chargers down to the Denver 14. And then Merlin Olsen would say, hey, God, let's when we look at a replay, you see the block made by so-and-so. And then how about the business decision that that cornerback made by that LT? You know, that that kind of stuff. So that, that's the way I approach it. What do you do actively um, to have the best relationship with your analysts, to bring the most out of them? Are there things that you do when you approach a broadcast I need to know this about what they like to do, how they like to call a game, how they like to be set up. Yeah, a lot of times in my, in my broadcast career, until I got the you know full time job with uh, with the Mariners, you know, I'd be working with mul a multitude of guys. I mean, I was working, I've worked with like a hundred five guys over the course of my my career. As a matter of fact, I give you an example. Like today, like my next game is Iowa at Michigan. I mean, I'm a full fledged Big East guy, but they called somebody, you know. The circumstance arose that they needed somebody for a, a game, and it happened at my time. My schedule was open, so I took it. So I, I reached out to uh, Nick Ba, who I'm working with, and Nick played, you know, does a really nice job doing Big Ten games. Lives out in Lincoln, uh, played it when he played at Kansas and Creighton, 
and I've heard him. He's good. So I call him up and I leave the phone tag. And, and then I got, I want to talk for like half hour, 40 minutes. Basically. I said, excuse me, I'm going to have to do, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for asking all these questions. Like, I'm, like I'm a prosecutor, like I'm Perry Mason or something, but, and then we went, it was great. We had a lot of laughs. We got a feel for him. He's got a great sense of humor. He's got a great laugh. He's got great energy. So I'm going, I'm, I was already fired up for the game. It doesn't take much for me to get fired up to do a broadcast, just as long as, you know, I have time to put my boards together. But and I was like, dude, we're going to have a blast. You know, fan of yours. I'm a big fan of yours. So you're good. So now, so, and then we'll go to the shoot arounds on uh, Saturday morning. I get in Friday night. I'll go to the morning. Uh, Iowa shooting in the morning and Michigan a little bit later. We'll hang out there. And you'll have, a, and then, you know, if, if he's already, he's got 10 years under his belt. He, and I've heard him. I've listened. He's worked with a lot of guys. It's going to be fun. And you try to, most of the time when guys are hired, you don't have to do an investigation because they're hired because they were a player of note or a coach of note who was a, good, a great communicator. So it's not like I'm sitting here instructing anybody, but you gauge who they are. And I think, I like to think, if you can't work with me, you got a problem. I think I'm like one of the easiest guys in America. Uh, to broadcast with because dude i'm gonna give you your time you're gonna get the chances have your say i'm not gonna be sitting there and, and, and trying to bogart the whole thing that ain't gonna happen and because it's a team effort especially on tv a, a producer engineer but eh, you know the whole thing the same i'm written a little less on radio but i i just i do my bit and when i stop obviously if you want to let it breathe a little bit great if you want to say something say it and just give, and then uh, particularly, and on TV, you can let it go a little bit longer, maybe especially in basketball into the next play. You can't do that in football. But most guys know that already. They be, they either intuited it or they've learned, you know, they they were taught it. So it, it, the exercise of trying, you're not educating anybody. They, you know, your preconceived notion is that he knows his stuff. He knows the mechanics of this. So basically, hey, man, nice to see you. How you doing? We're going to have some fun. Here we go. Three, two, one. Hi, everybody, and welcome. We got Iowa and Michigan today. Good game. A couple of teams trying to write themselves here in the Big Ten season. Dave Sims and Nick Bob with you. And Nick, what are we looking at here today? Boom. That's uh, I love that approach. Um, that's Don't overcomplicate it. It's not brain surgery. That's why we're freaking doing it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, if anybody trusted me to do brain surgery, it wouldn't go very well. Well, precisely. So, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your your personality on the air and how you've crafted who you are on the air. And there, there's a quote that I, I want to pull a piece out of. Um, Jason Benetti is a guy that that I interned for when I was coming up. And, um, you know, he used to I mean, he's a guy that pulls references from everywhere and oh, has yeah. the most extensive vocabulary of anything. I love, it. I love it. And it's always like you have to figure out the way to. Just be very descriptive in fun ways, pop yourself a little bit, but also not talk over your audience. And there was a, a a quote for you that said, there's a certain intellectualism he brings to a telecast. And that's amazing. And, and that's such a great, like, I, I love when people do that. But also, how do you balance what you're going to bring to a telecast with making sure that you're not talking over the heads of the audience and making sure you're engaging everybody successfully in, in a elevated conversation yeah you know i am not trying to do uh e equals mc squared but um <laughs> you know i like to have laughs i also have a frustrated stand-up comedian in my, in my bones so you know i try to throw out if i can throw out a pop reference that sort of encapsulates what just happened whether it's it's uh tragic or uh, heroic or sort of meh <laughs> and you can get a laugh out of somebody I do it. And I know my wife used to get on me and there's certain partners I've worked with and you throw a reference out and it's like crickets. <laughs> but I remember, I remember Costas and I had lunch. I mean, I'm not trying to name, name drop here, but Bob Costas and I had, uh, what was that last, where were we, this day, was October of uh, 22. And I, we were talking about this. He said, screw that. If you have a funny line, a line that you think that's funny, it's relevant. If two of your friends or fans get it, you win. Don't worry about it. And in this day and age, Google it. And even you know, there's other times I know Mike and Tony, you know, good friends of mine or PTI, and they they'll always because we're all in the same age bracket too. So I said, hey, hey kids, Google it. We're gonna talk about this guy. You know, hey, Wilt Chamberlain, you may want to Google him. He's a pretty good player. 
you know, that kind of stuff. So, and I, if you can't laugh, I mean, you, people want to have, when they, they watch a sporting event, they, they want to entertain. They want to be entertained by the game. And if, boy, I tell you what, you can sprinkle a few laughs and obviously the information and try not to choke them to death with stats. That's a winning broadcast, man. It's a winning broadcast. And the, the Netty was it? God, that's already two years ago. We had a rain delay in Chicago. Oh, and goodness. the Netty and Lenny, Lenny were doing a, a podcast. And we wound up doing like 45 minutes. And it was freaking hilarious. And they, it, it, you know, Benetti's razor sharp. And I think I'm pretty good. And we were just going back and forth. Len Castro. And uh, and one of the things he said along the lines of that quote that you just read, you know, a certain joy that I bring to the game. I said, yeah, I mean, it's escapism. It's fun, man. If you can't have fun doing this gig. You need to get the hell out. Yeah. What uh, What's your background do to help you? Because the like to start in, not everybody starts writing uh, and not everybody starts in talk radio. Like you've done so many different types of things. How has that made you a better play-by-play announcer? Oh, hey man, a world, expansive world. I've had to talk to people about sports or things I don't know. And you basically have to, you know, basically stick with the basic who, what, when, where, how, and why, and listen. Listening in, in terms of interviewing is so key. And so many times people will answer a question and man, that opens a door. And now you can go on that tangent and to further explain or, and explain what happened, why it happened, and then you come back to the main road, and then you take another offshoot. And I and and I had to. I was pretty good at it as a newspaper guy. Uh, I I was at, at the Daily News was a tabloid, and generally I only had five hundred words to write, and find a thousand words would have been a big feature. But when I I went to um, WNBC Radio on Sports Night in 19, March of uh, uh, eighty six. You know, when there was no game, I had 7.30 to midnight to fill. So you, I mean, I, I remember, and Mike Green was my producer, now Hall of Fame broadcaster. Way to go, Mike E. <laughs> He's been Hall of Fame. Um, he and Dom Trinelli were great producers for me. That's wild. Um, who was, uh, my boy, oh, Peter Westbrook, a black Japanese gentleman from the Newark, New Jersey area, who was on the American... Uh, fencing team, so that would have been coming into the 88 Olympics. What do I know about fencing? I watched Zorro as a kid on TV. It was a Disney thing. You know, I watched the movie of Time of Power, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it was fascinating going into an interview having no clue. First of all, dude, black and Japanese, first let's talk about that. What was that like growing up? And he was, you know, about five, six, five, seven, nine. You know, he wasn't going to be posting up uh, Shaq or anything like that. And how and why he got into fencing and and how it had worked and just a lovely guy and we just had a blast. Not the time we were, uh, we had uh, uh, Bart Giamatti when he was uh, commissioner of baseball. You know, God, unfortunately he he, you know, he he died way too young. And he came in twice and I think one time we did a half hour, another time we did an hour, and we wound up talking about he was a I think uh, English uh, his doctorate was like in English classics. We started throwing that around in a sports show. I was like, dude, talk about broadening your horizons. And I wasn't afraid to do it. And I think I got, I learned that from Larry King. Larry King, Larry King wouldn't interview anybody. And Larry was always like, well, I didn't read the book, but I know how to get the answers. And you can't read every book, but you do your best to read that. But if you just have, you know, basic human uh, intellectual curiosity, you know, I'm not going to say here, call myself intellectual, but basic human curiosity. You can have fun, man. And talking to people is 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 just, it's a, and especially, you know, people, if they're selling something, they're happy to be there. They're happy to have an opportunity. So they're going to talk. They're going to talk. So that's not a problem. So if you tee it up and if you probe and, and you want to, you, know, you can have, you know, agree to disagree and go back and forth. I, I wouldn't be good at this in politics. Because, I, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I, no, I have my stances and, and I, I would be what, I'd be pulling out a bazooka, but um, <laughs> but for for what for what I do, I mean, I love the arts. I mean, my mother, you know, my father worked in, worked his way up to an executive uh, position. You know, rare for a black guy back in the fifties and sixties. My mother was a librarian, so I got you know all these great books. I get these coffee table books about sports, about the arts, about uh, movies, TV. 
I loved watching 1930. And before, you know, the world of TV that you've grown up with, it was a hell of a lot smaller when I was a kid. And so, boy, a lot of times you'd be watching, you know, you'd watch, hey, my father would say, hey, that movie's really good, you know, from 1935, the classic starring, you know, Gary Grant, you know, Spencer Tracy, 1941, you know, Humphrey Bogart. I know that golden age of Hollywood. I love that stuff. I was exposed to a lot of that stuff. And those movies were great in terms of dialogue, in terms of uh, structure of storytelling and and all of that. I've like, I've soaked all that in and that's a, that's a, and then plus the whole jock thing playing and going to get I me mean, philly's a great sports town i mean i was watching wilt chamberlain when i was nine ten years old i've been going to philly's game since i was five or six i'm going to eagles game since i was seven or eight so I, this this i'm like eyeballs deep in all that stuff what'd you learn from how to structure storytelling from classic movies beginning you know real simple beginning middle end you know tee it up tell them it's like speech when you give a speech Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them and tell them what you told them. And 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 also, uh, as a sports writer, I mean, you got to go out and gather the news. You got to ask ask the right questions, and uh, and you put you got to put it together under pressure, particularly on game you know on deadline uh, for game. You know the features are a heck of a lot easier. You know you get a couple three hours to talk to somebody and put it down. But you know I've been, I'm used to. I wrote on deadline for, you know, I covered soccer. I covered college uh, football, baseball, basketball. I did fill in for uh, some you know, Yankee games, some Met games. As a matter of fact, that was at Chase Stadium. What was it? Uh, it was the Phillies and somebody. And, and up in Chase Stadium scoreboard, all of a sudden it, it flashed a fl Thurman Musson. Yeah, you know, it just died in a, in a plane crash. I, I never forget that. And I, I, it's just like, there weren't there was not a big crowd. Mets weren't very good. I just remember the poll was the, just the cast all over the press box and everything was like everybody shocked beyond words. So you learn over the years, you know, you take your lumps. I can remember, Sam, damn it, this sucks. Could you get rewrite this, please? You know, could you spell it correctly? You know, that kind of stuff. You get these old timers who are you know, Korean War veterans, World War II veterans, gnarled, grizzly, pink stained wretches. And, and you know, and it was a lot of great guys, but you know, you know, like in any business, you got your ball breakers and everything. So you know, I'm you know, I'm the first black guy who's a sports writer at the Daily, and the same at the the Inquirer. I'm I'm you know, in the history of Major League Baseball, I'm like the fourth or fifth black guy to have his own team. So I, I'm on. I, I'm enjoying a heck a, a, a different, a unique kind of ride. And uh, I you know, I thank my lucky stars. I thank God all the time. What does that mean to you? Um... Especially because, like, I, the representation factor of it, like, for somebody, for a young black person to now turn on a baseball game and say, he looks like me. Um, oh, it's huge. Oh, yeah. dude, it's huge. I mean, for, I, I, um, Bill White, great player, um, Giants, Cardinals, Phillies. Um, he was the first, pretty sure he was the first African American male I saw do like sports on the six, you know, six o'clock and you know, eleven o'clock news. And then, you know, of course, you know, he started the matter of fact, he was a sports director at the, the ABC station in Philly a year or two after he retired. I remember they got a uh, rights to do a Flyers telecast. And hey, I don't think he knew hockey from Adam, but they threw him one and made him do play by play. And then he turned into just a wonderful baseball announcer here in New York and just great guy. And you know, he's he's hanging in there. He's probably about 90 now. I talked to him a few times over the last few years and, and uh, National League president. That meant a lot. And I hear from kids now, um, you know, people, you know, like yourself are doing Zoom, you know, doing a, a podcast and whatnot. And, um, or I get guys who are maybe in the business or like, like Gary Thorne, matter of fact, Gary Thorne, who teaches at Arizona State. And I get to do like, you know, just do Q and A with students, that kind of stuff. I'm doing one, uh, what's today? Today, what's today? Wednesday, I think I got one tomorrow with uh, students at, I, at Indiana University. And it's nice, you go around and and I get more, I think I get ex just excited if I see a young black kid doing play by play, I'm like, you gotta be kidding, this is great. And I reach out, you know, my wife says, man, you, 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 uh, kudos to you for reaching out to these people and say, hey man, I saw you, you know, Everett Fitz you, our guy in Seattle. He got the job. 
first of all, I saw a story on him that he was doing hockey and I flipped out. I said, you have a kid. I looked this guy I said, dude, rock on, man. And then like a year later, he gets the, uh, the Seattle Kraken job. And I said, dude, here's my name and number. When you get to Seattle, call me. We became boys, man. Hey, great dude. He won uh, the NSMA Sportscaster of the Year uh, for this past year. I won it three straight years. And he said, I got to catch up to you. I said, you will. And uh, so I, I get a lot of joy in, in doing that because, and now it'd be, because of social media, you can reach out to guys. It's a heck of a lot easier. You know, I saw Bill White, you know, when I was, was in high school. I thought that was great. And now I try to reach out to guys. And and now when I see players, now Cameron Mabin, a bunch of guys, black guys who, any of the white guys, but especially the black guys, if they made the transition to TV, tell me, say, hey, man, been watching you for years. Legend. Hey, paving, you know, paving away. Legend. Legend. So I said, hey, man, thank you. So that that that's my feel on that. It's, it's, it's gratifying. And, and having grown up, seeing on TV and reading about you know, it's a way we live in a great country, but we're flawed as hell. Yep. And the whole segregation time, uh, you know, growing up and seeing that on TV in the fifties and sixties, my father said, "So you, you know, you don't have it so bad. All I'd ask you to do was uh, vacuum, you know, the upstairs, and you're beefing about it. Were you kidding me? You know, people are getting fire hosed and dogged and everything, and you're acting like an idiot." And I was like, "That was the last conversation we had to have in that regard." So. And knowing that there were like no opportunities and, and and people have opened doors for me and I've gone through and I think I've scored a touchdown on pretty much in every stuff I, I've made. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, knowing when to ask the right question. Um, and I want to ask you a specific question you've asked along the path in your career, because there was an article that talked about when you got the job at Temple, um, you had met Bill Cosby through... Yeah. Um, being on WFAN. Yeah, yeah, we were in the same building, yeah. Yeah, he he had said, if you ever need anything, let me know. And I I feel like it's a great lesson in not being afraid to put yourself out there. Uh, Walk me through that interaction and I guess having the guts in that moment to say like, this is what I want. Well, there's a a couple extra pieces on that story. What happened, uh, FAN uh, started out at Kaufman Astoria Studios. They used to make movies there in the 20s and the 30s and whatnot. And they had unbelievable black and white pictures all over the place. I mean, so many stars were there. Uh, forget about it. The Cosby Show at that point was the number one show and just rolling. My brother-in-law had, was a Syracuse guy. Got out in 87 a year. They lose to Indiana in the national final. Um, so he's like a production assistant uh, downstairs. And, you know, as I said, the Cosby Show is an absolute giant. Uh, Bill's right-hand guy, Italian guy, Frank, I can't remember his last name, forgive me. But anyway, Frank was a great guy, Italian guy from uh, Little Italy here in Manhattan. Um, so I get, Danny calls me, he says, you know, my guy Frank, you know, who's uh, Bill's assistant, and we're talking, and he says, yeah, he heard you, because I was at FAN doing middays with Ed Coleman at that point. And he said, hey, I listen to this guy on FAN, he's really good. He says, yeah, my brother in said, yeah, no, no kidding. Yeah, tell him to come on down sometime. Meet, I'm going to meet him, maybe I'll introduce him to Bill. Take him up on that. I go down there one day, and Bill wasn't there, but I talked to Frank. He was there, Frank Scotty. And um, yeah, if you ever need anything, let me know. I said, well, I'd like to meet Bill. Yeah, yeah okay. Quiet, you know, he'll be in tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Go in and meet him, and we start talking, and yeah, what are, you know, what's going on? And then we, we meet, and we showed him a picture of my son, and they were looking for a role, he was a five-year-old kid, and he fit the role perfectly. And of course, when... And, and I take my kid in there and he saw Bill come in and he adored Cosby and he just froze. And, you know, I said, well, there goes your acting career, kid. But I said that, um, well, I, I hear that the Temple radio job might be open. I'm dying to do play by play. All right, cool. Shook hands. And, uh, that must have been like a Wednesday, Thursday. Monday, I get a call. Oh, Dave, this is Dr. Peter Lear, of course, from Temple University. Mr. Cosby speaks very highly. Have you welcome to the family? You're going to be our next radio play-by-play guy for uh, Temple University. So that's how that happened. And then subsequent, so this is what, right? This is, this would have been 1990 summertime. Actually, not, they probably weren't. It was probably, it was probably May, right before the season, the, the TV season ends. So it's probably May of 90. So I go, I do Temple football in 1990, 1991, I was on ESPN. Um, my tapes, they liked them. And, and I remember doing, I think I did a South Florida 
against South, uh, no, UAB. UAB against South Florida in Tampa was my first game on ESPN. And things really took off from there. And then when I started moving up the ladder a little bit and getting 8-10 or Big East games, and I'd get some games at Temple. And they knew I was from Philly, so they made it easy to take the train down. And it was a lot of times Cosby would be at the game. I'd wave him over. He'd come. I remember one time that I was on a UMass Temple game, and UMass Temple was killing UMass. Like, he came over and sat down with us. It was funny as heck. We laughed, and then it became a game that we thought we politely told him, like, get lost. <laughs> and then UMass came on and win the game. And it was it was great. So that happened about three, four times. He'd be down in Philly when I'd be doing a, a game. And well, and then you know what? Hey, you know, he was the biggest thing in America, and then all this stuff happens. You know, it's like, oh, geez, who knew? Uh, and then I subsequently met a woman who's a who stage manager for us in Oakland. Uh, yeah, stage manager. And I, I was talking to a camera guy who's Philly, from Philly. Long story, real quick story. This oh. guy Pete from Philly, and we're, we're shooting a breeze. And yeah, just like he's Italian from South Philly, and black guy from North Philly. And we're just hitting it off and just breaking chops and having a lot of fun. And this woman said, Well, I knew Cosby. Yeah, I'm one of his victims. I went, Oh, God. That was absolutely my, I, I just, all of a sudden, you know, it's like an hour before the, before a game with Mariners and A's and she tells me the story and I was like flipping out, man. That was, oh God. That's and, and it was just, it just hurt me to my core. The fact that it, he was accused and convicted of all that stuff. But one thing, and another interesting story, I'll never, I'll never forget this. Um, when I was on Westwood, I was doing a tournament and um I get this uh, email, Norman, Norman Brokaw was his agent. And he said, just want to let you know, Mr. Cosby loves listening to you call it the tournament on radio. And said, in fact, he was driving home one day and was listening to the game. And then he got out of the car, went in his house, turned the game on. He said, screw this. I'm going back to the car, sit in the car and listen to the day, finish the game. I still have that email somewhere in my, my files. How about that? That's wild. That's wild. Yeah, you live long enough, crazy things can and will happen to you. And, and you know, it's yeah, it's the benefit of uh, staying fit. And you know, I I helped kick my coverage when I got married. I'm 41 years married, my wife's unbelievable, and uh, the kids, my my boys have been great. And you know, well, I'm able to to do do what I always set my set my course out to do. Building off of off of that story though um you're you're on the radio in new york at that point in your career but do you ever wonder how things would have gone or maybe been differently if you didn't just say hey here the temple job is open uh let me take this guy up on his offer oh yeah i would have uh you know i've, I've had some, I, I won't even go into the near misses that i've had but i would have probably uh Tried to stay doing doing talk radio. I mean, I liked it. I didn't love it the way I love doing play by play, but I liked it a lot. And man, did it open doors! I mean, open doors to uh, doing a simulcast with MSG Network, open the doors to doing the Seoul South Korea Olympics in '88, and uh, open the doors to uh, almost doing NFL in 1989. But then Mike Weissman, the producer, got fired. Uh, so no, I would have stayed. I would have probably stayed with that, and then uh, I would have continued to. You know, pursue play, but yeah, play by play. Um, but yeah, that. I mean, you know, as they say, things happen for you know for a reason, and, and it's how you, when that door opens, get through it, and you know, make the best of it. Yeah. You, know? you mentioned earlier being on the air when the news broke that Thurman Munson had passed. You know, it, it's funny to think about now because of the the news age that we live in how that information would be consumed if it were to happen today. I mean, I, I, I was calling a basketball game when Kobe Bryant passed away. I remember Oof. how that Oof. all played out. Um, but in that instance, like there's that's how you find out because it's on the scoreboard in the stadium. Like you're not getting a text or checking your phone and Twitter and all of that. Um, well, how do you handle that moment? I really don't remember a heck of a lot about it. Obviously I wrote about it and uh, I, I probably – I'm a, I imagine, uh, you know, so you probably go through the files and find it, but I probably got, no doubt, got some reacts at post game. You know, the game story was whatever, but uh, I'm sure I wrote about what the atmosphere was like. But yeah, that, what year was that? That was uh, 79, 80 and thereabouts, something like that. I, I left the Dilly News in 82, so it was in that window. Yeah. Yeah. Th I think that's, you know, 40 plus years ago. That's yeah, 79. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's different time, man. Yeah. Do you remember, or I guess, do you have any moments 
specifically from the broadcasting side that were like, this is a unique, like, I'm never going to forget being in this moment right now. Now, it, 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 you know, in terms of something outside of the world of sports it, it, or in the it, either way, Well, I mean, nothing. I mean, just I, I mean, I think some some great games I've called that kind of stuff, but nothing is as deep as, you know, I, I wasn't on the air with. I was on the, you know, I saw Ted Koppel the other day and see this um, uh, Sunday morning. And when Al Campana said that, you know, that the blacks lacked the necessities, that whole thing, I was on the air at that time. So that was like, and I used to call it open phone uh, New York, and we'd go that last half hour or hour, depending on the, what the uh, guest load was. And I can remember, you know, I'm, I got my, I'm, you know, I'm running my own board. I got the two TVs up. I know at least one, maybe two TVs up here. And somebody, and I remember, yeah, you know, we had regular callers. I think the, now the late Bruce from Flushing called. He says, Dave, you're not gonna believe, and he calls me and tells me a story. So I turn on it. I, I turn up the volume. I'm listening. I was like, "Oh my god, that's I do remember that happening." And that whole and then people in the last ten minutes reacted, uh, have because they saw it too, or heard what I had said in quoting uh, what was happening there. So that that was pretty wild. That would probably, in terms of impact, and that was that was and still is a big story. You know what Campana said and the reaction to it and everything. So that 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 definitely comes to mind. Yeah. Um. I want to bring this full circle because we talked about preparation at the beginning and I know uh, you do a lot of media coaching and you, you do a lot of media coaching with athletes too. In yeah, we did that. We did that before. Uh, what did we do that? Oh, 2098, 99 to 2006. And then I got the Mariner job at seven. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, what, uh, what would you say to a broadcaster that when you think about what you would tell a, an athlete to prepare for an interview with the media, um, what would you tell a broadcaster to say, this is the best way you can get the best answer out of an athlete? How can you, if you're about to go into an interview, how can you put them in the best position yeah. to give you the best answer? Well, a, a lot of, first of all, hopefully you're in a situation where you had, to, had a chance to meet the guy beforehand. That's not, not always the case. I get that. But like, if you go up and, uh, you know, just basic human niceties. Hey, man, I'm you know, my name's Dave Sims. I'm with uh, I'm with KYW TV. Got a couple of minutes. Just got to ask you a couple of questions. A couple of you know, but I hope you can help me out. Boom. That's all you can do. I mean, um, and because of the situation, you know, I'm with you know with a baseball team, and you know, I'm with them every day. And most of the time, when I'm going up to guys pregame. I don't do much post game. I save it for the next afternoon. But pre game, I like to go in the clubhouse, both clubhouses. And if there's one or two guys, or you know, just yo, what's up? Hey, what do you got for me today? That kind of stuff. And when they get used to seeing you, you know, you hear, hear, hear things, and it's amazing how you just fall into stuff sometimes. And you know, I say, hey man, how's it going? Uh, how you feeling? Eh, you know, a little here and there. Yeah, my kid got sick and he get me sleep. That kind of stuff. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you know I, I work it in. Um, and, and the other thing I always say, people seem to think that there's a magic bullet for this stuff. I mean, there's not, but I said, you know what? Basic thing. Don't be an asshole. Golden rules always in play. Start from there. Now you're on. Take it from there. Dave, I appreciate you taking the time, uh, and being a part of this. And, uh, thanks for giving me a, about a half hour or more here. And, uh, let me pick your brain a little bit. Yeah, man. No problem. <laughs>